Hello, everyone. This webinar is being brought to you by the ACR Commission on Radiation Oncology Education Committee. Before we begin the session, please join us in a moment of silence to acknowledge the difficult times that everyone continues to face with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, social injustice, and in general for our cancer patients and their families. Thank you. Before we move forward, please remember to mute your microphones and use the Zoom communication tools such as the Q&A, chat, and virtual raise hand features to submit or ask your questions. We'll plan to have time for audience Q&A at the end of each presentation. General description of our webinars is listed here. Next slide. Today we'll be focusing on the topic of heavy ion radiotherapy, which will include clinical applications and future directions in radiation oncology. Objectives are listed here. This should be an insightful talk, especially for those of us in the United States without much access to heavy ions in the clinical setting. For those who are unaware, this is part of an ongoing series of webinars. To view previous topics, such as the radiation oncology MASH and alternative payment model, please refer to the ACR website. I will be moderating this, discuss this discussion. My name is Aaron Bush. I am a radiation oncology resident at Mayo Clinic and serve as the national resident representative to the ACR. I would now like to introduce our speakers for this webinar. First, we have Dr. Timothy Mouth, who is currently the chief resident at Mayo Clinic, where he developed a significant interest in particle therapy. As an emerging leader in this field, he has published and also presented extensively on a variety of topics, such as heavy ion therapy protons and boron neutron capture therapy. He's a co-editor for the upcoming textbook, Principles and Practice of Particle Therapy, to be released by WIDA this year. Dr. Malf's research goals include critically evaluating and expanding the indications for novel radiation modalities, including ion therapy. Next, we have Dr. Hiroshi Suji, who is a board certified radiation oncologist and director general at the National Institutes for Quantum Science and Technology Hospital in Chiba, Japan, which is the longest running carbon ion facility since 1994. Dr. Suji graduated from Hokkaido University and currently serves as a member on the Japan Society for Therapeutic Radiology and Oncology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and Particle Therapy Cooperative Group, among others. Dr. Suji is no stranger to presentations such as this, as he has given hundreds of them and has over 75 major publications published. All right, well, thanks again to everyone for joining. At that, I would like to go ahead and hand the virtual mic off to Dr. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for the kind introduction. I am working on sharing my screen right now. Okay, so over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I just wanna give kind of a basic introduction on heavy ion radiation and why, especially here in the United States, uh, we should care. And so this will just be a basic overview of some of the key points um, and, and some of the major factors of why people would treat with heavy ion radiation. So I have no disclosures. So first of all, we're gonna have a very brief uh, history of heavy ions. I know this isn't really a history lecture, so I'll keep this to one slide so, so you don't all fall asleep. Um, and then I'll go into why heavy ions, including some of the radiobiologic and physics um, advantages and then when should we use carbon? And I think that's the million dollar question here. And I wanna to touch a little bit on that before Dr. Suji tells about uh, his experience in Japan. So a very brief history of heavy ion radiation. Um, it's actually been used both in the clinical and preclinical setting uh, for many years. And Lawrence Berkeley was, was doing work on a whole smattering of ions including carbon, helium, neon, so on and so forth, uh, pretty much since the 1970s. And there was even a little bit of work before that. Um, unfortunately, that program shut down in the early 90s, uh, but was restarted shortly thereafter in Japan in 94, and then followed by a center opening in Germany shortly thereafter. Currently, um, carbon ion is the only real, really uh, majorly used heavy ion in clinical practice, and we'll discuss why that is, uh, but the, the majority of this talk will be on carbon ions. And then at least here in the United States, uh, the high initial costs, operational costs, and just a high level of expertise needed to treat with heavy ion therapy, and this has really limited its ado adoption here in the U.S., 
So looking at uh, the current centers, they're mostly localized in, in Asia and Europe. And so there are a total of 13 places currently treating with, with heavy ions, all carbon, with the majority of them in Japan and in China. Uh, there are two centers in Germany and a couple throughout um, the rest of Europe, such as in Italy and Austria. And corresponding with this, this increase in centers over time, you can see a nice increase in the number of patients treated from the early 90s to now. And really, over the next decade, I expect this slope to continue to go just like that. There are several centers that are currently in various stages of development, um, including one here in the United States. And that is uh, my, my very own center right now, Mayo. Uh, but there's also a couple other centers throughout the world that are, are starting to uh, either develop or starting construction on, on centers, including a few more in Asia, South Korea, and then one in France. So it'll be exciting to see over the next decade or longer, um, more clinical data and more experience getting treated uh, with this technique. So the question, why heavy ions? Why should we care? So in order to answer that, we first of all have to understand what are heavy ions. And I think we all remember this from even high school uh, chemistry. Heavy ions, or what we treat with typically, electrons and protons, are typically small. You know, these are the subatomic particles but when you start adding multiples of these together, you get atoms. And those you have carbon, neon, silicon, helium, argon, these are all much more massive. And so just based on their size, these have unique physical and hence radiobiologic properties uh, that really make them hopefully advantageous. And we'll, we'll talk very much in depth about each of these principles. So in order to really understand heavy ions and the role, there are a few definitions that we need to talk about first. And one of them, and I think a lot of us remember this from basic radiobiology, is linear energy transfer. And the text definition of that is just the amount of energy that a particle gives per unit distance. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Here is a very handy diagram that really kind of illustrates this. And so here is a low LET radiation, say electron or, or photon that travels through a medium, and has energy deposition and ionization events. And that's what each of these red dots are. With high LET along the particle tract, you have a lot of energy de deposition and then a lot of uh, ionization events. So you can tell this is kind of sparse and, and somewhat haphazard where the red dots, the red ionization events are. But with high LET, of which carbon is one, you'll notice that there's quite a few more. Kind of along the same token, the other definition that we need to know is relative biologic effectiveness, RBE. And this is just a ratio comparing for the same amount of physical absorbed dose, the biologic effect. So for instance, for X number of dose, we would expect carbon to have a much higher effect than for that similar physical dose of X-rays. And kind of the gold standard for this is to compare it to X-rays. And so when we talk about RBE um, for carbon, that's compared to X-rays that we would use in the clinic. So focusing specifically on carbon, as we've talked about, it is high LET. And I find this graph really kind of hammers home the point. Um, each of these dots is a ionization event. Over here, you have electrons and you can tell along the the path, which would be a straight line, um, they're kind of scattered, few and far in between. Same thing with protons, with a higher LET as we get lower energy. And then over here with carbon, you can just see they're very densely packed, densely populated. So this is a much higher LET than what you would expect even with protons. And so it takes this effect and basically magnifies it. And so what, how does this translate bi biologically? Well, here's a DNA mo molecule, and I think we all know with uh, photons, it comes in and it causes mostly indirect damage, single base pairs, so on and so forth. With, with carbon, which is much more massive, this is like a cannonball coming in. It just smacks up against the DNA, causes very complex DNA damage, um, and especially since it deposits such high amounts of energy over the, over the length transferred, you know, there's a substantial amount of DNA damage that can occur. 
So whereas I equate an X-ray is, is like an arrow or a bullet, this is more like a cannonball flying through a target. And so this just hits the DNA, completely obliterates it. Um, and that can be good and bad. And we'll talk more about what this looks like clinically. So kind of along the same token, um, carbon has a high RBE. And that number ranges based on the tissue based on the estimate, but it can range anywhere from one to three, and I've even seen uh, some reports of four and higher. This is a diagram of increasing RBE by increasing depth, and I'm sure you can all uh, see the general shape of, say, a Bragg peak here. Uh, carbon is green, and so it has a pretty low entrance RBE, uh, at least for tissue, and then a very high RBE at a certain depth, which in this case would be where the tumor is. It's also very important to note, especially as we talk about carbon clinically, that because of its high LET and RBE, it really doesn't have much of an oxygen effect. Most of its DNA damage is by the direct effect. And so its OER, its oxygen enhancement ratio, approaches one, making this a theoretically uh, advantageous in hypoxic tumors. So I've kind of alluded to it before, just like with protons, carbon's ex carbon experiences a Bragg peak. Um, and so I think we're all very familiar with this graph. This is a energy distribution for different forms of radiation. Photons, we're all familiar with this. Uh, proton and carbon, does they both exhibit a Bragg peak. So what does that mean clinically? I really like this diagram because this highlights several different factors of carbon ion beams that are important to know. This is just a single beam shot through a patient at a target near the brainstem. So we're all familiar with x-rays. You have a buildup region, high energy at a certain depth, and then it tapers off. With carbon, it exhibits a Bragg peak. So it's a low energy going in, high energy at a certain depth, and then it just kind of tapers off. And here's what this looks like um, graphically. Very similar to protons in that regard. A couple differences and a couple things to, to keep in mind as we, we talk about the advantages and disadvantages of pro or carbon. Because it's a high RBE and it just comes in and really smashes up against the DNA, it can shoot off um, fragments. It can shoot off basically shrapnel from the DNA. We call that a fragmentation tail, and that is this blue dose right behind the Bragg peak. And this is typically pretty hard to model and pretty hard to predict. And so there will be a, a little bit of dose distal to the Bragg peak just based on that fragmentation tail. And this effect is much more pronounced in carbon than say with protons or, or lighter ions. The other really important thing to note is that the lateral penumbra with carbon is much sharper than with x-rays. And it's even much sharper than with protons. So that's a nice little advantage that we can, can use when designing carbon ion plans. Putting it all together, um, this is an X-ray plan, an SBRT plan for a lung lesion. This is a carbon ion plan, very similar dosimetrically to what you would expect to see from a proton plan. I just put this in here for illustrative purposes. So as, in a, as kind of a consequence of the Bragg peak, the sharp lateral penumbra, Carbon really affords us the ability to have a lower integral dose, very similar to protons. And you can see from this, this blown up figure, with photons, all of this light blue is, is low dose. It's largely missing in protons and in carbon. But the big question is, does this reduce secondary malignancies, which is the big concern uh, with the integral dose? And there's this nice retrospective population study that looked at this, and the short answer is yes, it does. Um, compared to photon radiation, carbon ion radiation reduces the risk of rectal cancer and bladder cancers in prostate cancer patients getting treated in this population from Japan. And I would refer you to the paper uh, for more details regarding the study because I think it is a very interesting study, uh, but the short answer is yes. And this is going to be a very promising area that we can look into moving forward. So I don't want to go into the weeds about dose modeling, but I just want folks to be aware that there's a couple different ways that we can model dose for carbon. Um, in Japan, they developed the microdosimetric kinetic model, the local effect model, and all of its um, 
subsequent revisions of that were developed in Europe. They are very similar, but a little bit different. And so when you're looking at doses, especially comparing different studies or you're reading the literature, the doses will be a little bit different between if the study was done, say, in Japan versus if it was done in Germany. So does that matter? Um, still don't know. There's concerns about underdosing tumors. Uh, it is difficult to compare the results if one's getting treated with one dose fractionation and somewhere else is getting treated with a different dose fractionation. It's just difficult to compare the results. Um, and there's no established OAR constraints just based on the different models. And so that's something hopefully moving forward, um, we can get some clarity on over time. But there are different models right now that we use. And so just keep that in mind when you're looking through the data. So when should we use carbon? You know, this is a very expensive modality. It's something that, that we're a, a lot of us are excited about. So when should we use it? And I oftentimes think about it in this very handy nomogram. Um, I, I think about this when I think of, could a patient benefit from carbon and should we even look at that disease site for carbon? And long story short, traditionally radioresistant tumors, traditionally hypoxic tumors, given the low OER, tumors that have high toxicity with conventional treatment and tumors with essentially no other options um, or poor standard of care right now should be considered for carbon, especially in early clinical trials. But the big take home message I wanna say here is traditionally radio resistant and hypoxic tumors could potentially benefit the most from carbon. So to this end, there's been a lot of retrospective and early phase clinical trials that, that have suggested the efficacy and safety of carbon for a whole variety of disease sites, um, including gliomas, meningiomas, so on and so forth. Data so far has been largely limited to retrospective and early phase studies, although there are lots of clinical trials currently accruing. And this just gives you an idea of what was out there. This diagram is now actually a couple years old. Um, and a quick hit on clinicaltrials.gov shows uh, over 20, I believe there's 24 clinical trials uh, currently accruing through clinicaltrials.gov, uh, mostly in Europe and in Asia, although we do have two uh, open here in the US. So that's kind of the brief whirlwind, whirlwind introduction into carbon. Um, I'll pass the baton over to Dr. Suji and we can take questions whenever. All right. No, really appreciate that introduction, Dr. Mouth. Uh, for those of us without any experience uh, with heavy ions, I, I really appreciate you just still on a quite complex topic down into more straightforward terms we can all actually hopefully understand. I would exactly like to now transition over to Dr. Um, Suji's presentation. So please give us a moment to bring up the slides. Oh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for kind of introduction. Uh, I'm Hiroshi Tsuji, uh, Director General of the QST Hospital in Chiba, Japan. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, this opportunity to talk at uh, this uh, webinar about the experience of uh, uh, carbon ion therapy. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is a bird's eye view of a treatment facility called HIMAC. Uh, <clears throat> HIMAC. And a treatment room with a rotating gantry of carbon ion therapy. These are the particles used in radiation therapy. Among the types of particles, proton is uh, widely used in cancer therapy. Heavy ions such as helium, carbon, and, and neon are tried to use at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the US in the past. And our facility, HIMAC, can also accelerate those ions enough for the cancer treatment. Uh, but we selected the carbon ions because the carbon ions beam, a uh, carbon ion beam has more obvious advantages than other particles on clinical use, which could uh, which would uh, result in improvement of therapeutic ratio in cancer therapy. As Dr. Maroff introduced, there are two advantages. One is physical advantage on dose distribution based on the dose peak called black peak. 
I think benefit from this, those concentration must exist in the most situation of radiation therapy in regard to sparing the normal tissue or giving higher dose to the tumor. Another one is biological advantage based on the dense ionization due to high, high linear energy transfer. It is also quite clear, particularly in the treatment of uh, a photon resistant tumor or locally advanced tumors. This is a kidney cancer case. It is well known radio resistant cancer, while the normal kidney tissue is easily damaged by radiation. For this patient, we performed localized radiotherapy by carbon ions. Consequently, tumor completely disappeared and uh, renal function was preserved. The patient is now alive without any recurrence or side effects. This feat can be achieved only with well-localized, highly, highly effective radiation using heavy ions. This is the history of carbon ion therapy in Japan. The clinical trial at our institute started in 1994. Following us, Hyogo, Gunma, Saga, Kanagawa, Osaka, and Yamagata studied the carbon ion therapy and now we can treat more than 3,000 patients in a year. All the treatment had, uh, had been performed as clinical trials until 2003, when the Japan, Japanese government approve, uh, approval for advanced medical care was obtained by the QST. Advanced medical care is a Japanese medical system to evaluate safety and efficacy of novel medicine in terms of uh, validity in coverage by the National Health Insurance in Japan. In this system, the treatment fee is free paid by the patient. Due to the favorable outcomes in the advanced medical care, the carbon ion therapy for the bone and soft tissue sarcoma was approved as an indication of National Health Insurance in 2016 and it was expanded to the head and neck tumors and prostate cancer two years later. In addition, the technical development was also progressed at the QST. In 2011, uh, the scanning radiation became available at the new treatment facility of the QST. And it was adopted at three uh, uh, following facilities of Kanagawa, Osaka, and Yamagata. Moreover, a rotating gantry was also developed at the QST in 2017, and the uh, latest facility in Yamagata has the second, a little smaller rotating gantry. A cooperative study group in Japan named J-Cross was organized in 2014. This is the yearly number of patients treated with carbon ions at the QST. A total number as of March 2021 was uh, 13,437. The yearly number had increased up to more than 800. However, it decreased once, mainly because of uh, changes of indication in the, in the applicable medical system. That was some restriction in the patient selection. The patient number was recovered by the expansion of indication of the National Health Insurance, particularly in prostate cancer. It was down again by the COVID-19 last year, but I think it will be recovered by the end of COVID-19 pandemic and uh, would be increased by further expansion of indication of the National Health Insurance, which will be realized soon. This graph indicates the number of patients at the QSD according to the tumor site. Major tumor sites are prostate, bone and soft tissue, head and neck, lung, pancreas, and liver. Top three sites have already been covered with National Health Insurance in Japan. The tumor with the yellow back have been the indication of advanced medical care at present. However, uh, this tumor will be covered with uh, National Health Insurance from coming April. 
This table in indicates the facility standard for the charged particle therapy in Japan, both carbon and protons. These conditions must be fulfilled to perform the particle therapy. Higher level of standard is required to carry out the particle therapy as an in the advanced medical care than national health insurance. Uh, two full-time radiation oncologists with more than two years experience of child particle therapy are required in both systems. They should have uh, also have uh, more than five years experience of radiation therapy in the national health insurance while 10 years of radiation therapy in the advanced medical care. Two radiation technologists per room, full-time medical physicist, nurse, QAQC system, and cancer board are necessary in both medical system. Furthermore, uh, the, the escrow committee uh, did it survey by the JASTORO and the case registration in the JASTORO radiation oncology database are also required for the advanced medical care. I'd like to briefly introduce the current dose fractionation of carbon ion therapy for each tumor in Japan. We attempted to decrease the fraction number, so it is generally fewer than those in the X-ray therapy particularly in power organs such as lung or liver. But even for the tumors of uh, serial organs, we could establish safe dose fractionations in 12 or 16 fractions. It is just a con continuation. Major, major organs, for, organs for the dose constraint in the carbon ion therapy are skin, brain, nerves, eyes, GI tract, lung and bronchus, and bladder and urethra. This depends on the tumor, tumor site, of course. At present, there is no combined treatment with other radiotherapy such as X-ray or proton, except for the combined therapy of uh, carbon and intracapitary radiotherapy for the uterine cervical cancer being performed at the Guma University. In order to make this treatment one of the standard therapies for cancers and covered with national health insurance, it was desired to be academically highly rated. For this purpose, it was required to perform multi-institutional studies. So we organized the JCROS, Japan Carbon Nine Radi Radiation Oncology Study Group in 2014. In the beginning, uh, in the beginning of the JCROSS, uh, there are four running institutes, and now it consists of seven institutes shown on this map. Introducing the order of rate, date, the first one is the QST, then Hyogo, Gunma, Saga, Yokohama, Osaka, and Yamagata. At present, there are 14 carbon therapy facilities in the world, so it means uh, half of them uh, uh, existing in Japan and belonging to the JCROS. Uh, these are the main activities of the JCROS. We prepared the dedicated database to registry all the patients receiving carbon ion therapy and actually managed it since uh, May, uh, May 2016. Uh, physical staff organized a QAQC team and performed the activities on physical and technical issues. And we medical doctors are performing multi-institutional clinical trials. In the beginning, we performed retrospective analysis on data gathering from four running institutes in major tumor site. And the prospective trials are also conducted in pancreas, liver, lung, rectum, and prostate. Uh, prospective observation, observational registry study means registration of all patients into the dedicated database written in number one. This slide shows the data flow of the dedicated database of the JCROSS. The data of all the patients from seven facilities, including the QST, are uh, gathered from uh, gathered through the uh, electric data capture directory. 
The data are monitored by the CRO twice a year and inspected by the uh, audit committee of the JCROS once a year. In addition, annual report is submitted to the Japanese uh, Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. And the part of the data are directly transferred, transferred to the JROD, that, uh, that is the official database of Japanese Society of Radiation Oncology. As I said, we performed a number of multi-center multi clinical studies. Top table is a list of multi-center retrospective studies by the JCROS. We gathered and analyzed the data of the patient who underwent carbon dioxide therapy for these tumors at the JCROS facilities. Many of these retrospective studies have been already finished and the results were published. Bottom table is the list of ongoing prospective studies of the JCROS. These are the studies aiming to prove the advantages of carbon ion therapy over other treatment. It was difficult to perform a randomized control trial in trials in the beginning of the JCROS, so these are performed as a single arm trial with a proper historical control. If we can uh, obtain a favorable outcome by these studies, I think we can perform a phase three study. These are the situation of multi-center prospective studies of JCROS. A total of 321 patients were enrolled to one of the studies. For the studies of the prostate cancer and the post-operative recurrent rectal cancer, the patient registration was already finished while other three studies for the liver, lung, and uh, pancreas continue the registration. This table shows the number of patients treated uh, at, our, uh, at any of uh, carbon, carbon, carbon therapy facilities in Japan from May 2016 to June last year. That is uh, five years and two months. More than 15,000 patients underwent the carbon therapy during this period, and 58% of them were the indication of national health insurance in Japan. I'd like to show you some examples of the outcomes of carbon therapy. Uh, top case is an osteosarcoma of the sacrum. Before the treatment, quite large tumor de destructed and uh, invaded into the sacrum. Surgery could not, could not be applied and the x-ray is not effective to this tumor. Uh, the tumor is disappeared by the carbon dioxide therapy and the patient is alive and he, he can walk almost normally at present. Bottom patient is an 81 years old lady suffered from an osteosarcoma of the fifth cervical spine. An abdominal soft tissue density mass was uh, a uh, with destruction of the spine uh, were re recognized on CT before the treatment. A CT scan uh, at uh, eight years later, uh, carbon nine therapy shows uh, apparent tumor regression and re regeneration of the vertical body no spinal injured was occurred. This is the treatment result of carbon therapy in osteosarcoma. The five-year local control rate was uh, 61% and five-year overall survival rate, survival rate was 32%. Very advanced and uh, in inoperable osteosarcoma, as I showed you uh, in, in the previous slide, Long survival could not be expected in the past, but uh, carbon ion therapy can offer a uh, comparable survival chance to those with uh, operable osteosarcoma. A sacral chlorodoma uh, can also be well controlled by the carbon ion therapy without a severe side effect. You can see the dramatic uh, decrease in tumor size on the MRI images. Propensity score matched the case control study of the Mayo Clinic and the QST shows quite impressive outcomes. 
that is uh, significantly better survival rate compared to the X-ray as shown in the left graph. And in addition, uh, carbon ion therapy could provide a comparable survival rate of surgery with a lower rate of uh, peripheral motor neuropathy. Non-square muscle car carotinoma in the head and neck region is also a very good candidate for the carbon ion therapy. Uh, left the top, uh, you can see a huge mass of uh, adenoid cystic carotinoma occupying the left maxillary sinus. Surgery might be applicable, but severe complication could not be avoided. So this is actually an op inoperable case. Even with such an inoperable case, carbon ion radiotherapy has succeeded in achieving an uh, overall survival rate of 68% uh, at five years, which is uh, substantially higher than X-ray and with a lower toxicity rate. Same can be said with mucosal malignant melanoma as shown in light uh, bottom table. Five years survival rate by carbon therapy is much better than X-ray uh, and uh, with lower rate of uh, adverse event. One of the effective methods to show the, use, the usefulness of the treatment is uh, systematic review, as you know. We performed it in the prostate cancer in cooperate, cooperation with uh, proton therapy facilities in Japan. This is a published report of, this, of the system, systematic review. As a result of the review, five-year bio, biochemical relapse-free survival of the carbon ion therapy in high-risk group uh, seems a little better than the uh, IMRT. And the incidence of uh, lecture toxicity is obviously lower than the IMRT. Due to this, uh, these uh, favorable outcomes of the review, carbon ion therapy for the prostate cancer could be covered with uh, national health insurance in 2018. Moreover, we could also obtain quite impressive results regarding the incidence of secondary cancer after carbon ion therapy for the prostate cancer. That is uh, significantly lower than that of after X-ray therapy and no cancer increased compared to the morbidity in normal, normal population. Also, observational period of, of 10 years would not be enough, but we think this is a quite important fact to deny the long rumor that the heavy ion radiation causes high incidence of the secondary malignancy. And resectable pancreatic cancer is an extremely challenging disease with a very poor prognosis by current standard treatment. Attempts with chemo radiotherapy have marginally improved outcomes. This tumor is also a good candidate for carbon ion therapy, we think. And the clinical result of carbon ion therapy combined with uh, gemcitabine chemotherapy has demonstrated impressive survival probability, that is, uh, uh, twice higher than the uh, combined radiotherapy, combined chemo radiotherapy with X-ray. Recently, more aggressive chemotherapy also provided uh, provide a uh, good survival results. So I think we should plan a comparative study of aggressive chemo versus aggressive chemo plus carbon therapy. In the pancreas cancer, we also treat an operable case as a, a preoperative treatment. After this co uh, combined treatment, <coughs> we oh, sorry, we obtained five-year survival rate of fifty percent. Furthermore, postoperative local recurrent pancreas cancer is also possible to be treated by the carbon ion therapy if the tumor is still localized. And uh, two-year survival rate was also apparently better than X-ray therapy. This slide shows the pro uh, process of our clinical trials for peripheral lung cancer. We started the trial with a carbon ion therapy of six weeks. 
Then we have decreased the number of tractions and successfully established the single session treatment. Adverse reaction has not increased by decrease of fraction number. This slide shows the survival and local control curves and uh, case treated with single session carbon ion therapy. Five year survival rate of was uh, 86.9% and the local control rate was uh, about 95%. Comparing the outcomes in single session carbon ion therapy with surg surgery X ray SBRT or proton therapy, overall survival after carbon ion therapy seems comparable to that of surgery and substantially better than other radio therapies. Moreover, no patient has developed grade three or higher lung toxicity after, after the carbon ion therapy so far. We could establish the short course carbon ion therapy also for the hepatocellular carcinoma, that is two fractions in two days. This is a patient with a giant liver tumor, more than 10 centimeters in diameter. After the two fraction carbon ion therapy, the tumor was apparently decreased in size. There has been no severe adverse event until now. Comparing local control rate and the survival rate of this primary liver cancer with proton therapy at the Japanese Institute, they are comparable, but more ordinary fractionation were used in the proton therapy. So it can be said that two fraction carbon therapy, carbon therapy can offer similar results so that uh, to the proton therapy of conventional fractionation in the treatment of the uh, liver cancer. Post-operative locally recurrent rectal cancer is another good candidate for the carbon ion therapy, we think. Generally, the patient referred to a hospital are uh, inoperable like the one you, you see in the left, uh, left uh, upper left. These patients are forwarded to the systemic chemotherapy, but the most cases are incurable. However, the carbon ion therapy is effective. And actually, the result of carbon ion therapy is even better than surgery for uh, uh, operable cases. Regarding the technical aspect, we used the passive radiation for the carbon ion therapy until 2011, where the carbon ion beams were spread, uh, spread by the wobbler magnet or the scatterer, enough for covering the tumor. It is uh, inevitable for this method to irradiate high dose to some part of the surrounding normal tissue. So we developed the scanning radiation of carbon ion beam, uh, which can op uh, offer more concentrated uh, dose distribution than conventional passive radiation. Uh, this is the simulation of the scanning radiation for the prostate cancer. As can be seen here, beam is scanned three-dimensionally to make desired dose distribution in the prostate. For the mobile tumor, such as liver cancer, we adopted the high speed scanning and respiratory synchronized gating to obtain desired distribution by the carbon ion beam. This movie shows the simulation of dose delivery by scanning radiation calculated by 4D CT data. Upper images show the radiation with respiratory movement. You can see the carbon ion beam is delivered only during the uh, Diaphragm, diaphragm is uh, elevated, that is expiratory phase. And during one expiratory phase, one layer is irradiated eight times with very fast scanning, scanning beam. Uh, finally, the accumulated dose distribution demonstrated in lower images becomes well localized and sufficiently homogeneous. An additional advantage of scanning radiation is to realize a rotating gantry. This is a rotating gantry developed here at the QST. It is the second rotating gantry of the carbon ion therapy in the world. 
The first one it is in Germany, which is much bigger than ours. Using this machine, it became possible to perform the, the intensely modulated radiotherapy with carbon 9 b In order to spread the carbon 9 therapy as a, a standard cancer therapy, the most important subject is uh, downsizing of the facility. We successfully developed a compact facility that is almost one third of the HIMAC, which was uh, constructed in Gunma University and other institutions in Japan. However, it is still quite large and should be miniaturized more. Our idea, it, was, uh, it will be one fortieth of the HIMAC, that is quantum scalpel, 5G heavy ion facility. This machine is not only small enough to be installed in ordinary hospital, but also of quite high performance. For obtaining high performance, we will develop much ion irradiation technology. The left figure shows a biological effect in the case of uh, current carbon ion radiotherapy. The biological effect is strengthened uh, around the boundary between tumor and the normal tissue, while that on the center of the tumor is medium. The reason is a uh, high irritant component tend to concentrate on the boundary. Much ion irradiation using helium, carbon, and oxygen, on the other hand, on the other hand, makes it possible to modify biological effect in the tumor, delivering strong irradiation to the tumor while low in the normal tissue surrounding the tumor. Utilizing this technology, we think one day treatment can be applied to a wide variety of cancers. That's why we call this machine scalpel. Development of quantum scalpel has been steadily progressed at QST, so that the hospitals in future, anywhere in the world, will have it as a standard equipment. Then the heavy ion therapy will have a, a quite important role in cancer therapy and will be no longer unreachable modality. This is my today's final message. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Suji, for the detailed overview. Uh, I'm sure most of us in the United States had no idea that carbon therapy had even been ongoing since the 1990s. And then we all really appreciate you sharing your clinical expertise. I did want to now uh, move on to any audience questions. I know we have a couple in the QA section. And so these, these questions will be open to both you, Dr. Suji, and Dr. Mao, uh, as far as answering these appropriately. So the first question is going to be related to hypoxia. So does any center treating with carbon ions screen patients tumors for hypoxia for patient selection? Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, the answer is no, not for, from an individual patient selection standpoint. Um, I feel like, like overall looking at all the, the different centers, um, more hypoxic tumors generally um, are treated, but Dr. Suji might have more insight into just that specifically. Um, uh, I think I, I, I couldn't catch correctly your question. And oh, that's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll repeat it. So the question was just, do you know, are any um, carbon facilities currently screening patients for hypoxia? Uh-huh. Um, um, I think it, no, but um, some um, basic research on, on this uh, issue uh, is uh, on, ongoing, but uh, not clinically, clinically used until now, I think, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, no, I'm not aware of any that do either. Is it something you've considered as far as trying to implement in the future, or is it still very much kind of a preliminary basic science phase? Yeah, I think so. Um, and uh, uh, actually, the treatment planning system uh, at our institute uh, can, can uh, um, 
take account the uh, hypoxical region in the tumor. But uh, uh, the method of the um, actual uh, um, oxygen, oxygen and, um, and and uh, <laughs> hypoxic situation by imaging or something like that, that it's not, not, not enough to, to be uh, developed yet. So um, I think it, it, it's still uh, uh, basic research. No, All right. okay. I no, appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to move to the next question. Um, so that question really has to do with um, just some insight as to how the research has been developed. So I know you, you, you showed us a lot of different studies and, and we acknowledge a lot of it is, is retrospective. What, what have been some challenges as far as, you know, the, there not being any randomized data or is there any type of um, goals to try and produce that data soon? Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, we, should, we should do it, uh, randomized control trial, but, um, uh, uh, not yet. Um, uh, the reason our facility has not enough uh, capacity or scale uh, to manage an you know, authentic uh, prostate comparative study by uh, only us by ourselves. Uh, so actually, it is difficult to implement uh, uh, control arm of the IMRT or surgery by ourselves. But that uh, you know, at our present, uh, at our, at at present, uh, we have uh, six uh, uh, brothers in Japan, so we can perform a comparative study as a multi-center trials. Uh, but we need still we need a good collaboration with other oncologists uh, engage, uh, engaged in the surgery or uh, IMRT. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to in, in Japan, but uh, we we will we can now we can do it. Uh, I think. I no, appreciate it. Um, do, do you are there any actual plans as of right now to get that started? Or is that still in development? Oh, we have some, but um, probably I. It is uh, not good timing to <laughs> uh, introduce that them. Um, okay, just, uh, understood. And the discussion. So right. No, understood. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, so this is uh, is very specific. It is what what doses were you using to treat or the osteosarcomas that you presented with carbon for the sacrum and C spine? Um, oh, for osteosarcoma, uh, a seven seventy point four gray uh, LB. Uh, in 16 fractions. And uh, sacral sarcoma, uh, 67.2 gray RBE, also in 16 fractions, currently. Got it, thank you. Um, next question has to do with immune modulation. Um, so uh, have, have, have either of you looked into solving basic research opportunities or used in clinical practice immune modulation as far as with your dosages, and then specifically related to the quantum scalpel that you recognized as well, as far as a future development. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I couldn't that. Uh... No, no, no problem. I'm probably talking a little bit fast. The question is, is, is related to um, immune response having to do with, you know, the section around the tuber um, when treating with carbon. Um, the specific question asks about immune modulation. Are you familiar with that? Immune modulation. What what, what does it mean? Immune, immune um, So like immune, like in within like immunotherapy. Uh -huh. okay, okay. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, no. uh, now, uh, actually, we uh, started uh, two uh, uh, clinical trials, very small one, but. Um, uh, it is uh, combined treatment of carbon with uh, immunotherapy uh, to the very advanced liver tumor, and another one is uh, uh, uterine cervical cancer. It just started, but uh, uh, we think it's a very interesting study to possibly uh, to be uh, 
uh, breakthrough of uh, new treatment uh, uh, strategy. And to kind of take a more theoretical um, look at that too, you know, that with carbon, you have the downstream biologic effects may be very different than after, say, photon ir irradiation. And mm -hmm. cellular mm -hmm. resilience is still being worked out for, for various diseases. And so things like the abscopal effect come back on the table, and that has been shown to, to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's still in its infancy, and I think that's a very exciting area moving forward the next 10, 20, 30 years to, to really look into. Thank you, yeah. No, I appreciate it. I'm gonna to move to the next question here. So uh, there was a specific question regarding um, one of the figures. Um, so in proton therapy, they, they, oh, they use the figure of 1.1 as far as the EBE, RBE, what is the multiplier that, that you all have used to calculate gray RBE in clinical practice of CIRT? I know that was lightly touched on by Dr. Malop. So they're, they're asking the conversion factor of RBE or radiologic biological equivalents. Uh, in Japanese experience, you, you, you mean? Right. Uh, uh, um... Uh, actually, we uh, we adopt the, adopted the uh, uh, RB of three point zero at uh, uh, eighty kV uh, uh, part of the um, carbon ion beam, and uh, so uh, um, um, difficult to answer. Uh, so we we um, we have performed the uh, dose escalation studies for each tumor, and then we uh, uh, evaluated the uh, LBE uh, in the clinical use. But uh, we don't change the factor of LBE or uh, um, according to the tumor uh, <clears throat> uh, pathology or. Uh, uh, something like that. So we, uh, now we are using the uh, uh, original uh, uh, RBE and uh, gray RBE. <clears throat> so uh, it is actually not a, uh, really equivalent to the photon dose, but uh, just uh, so we, uh, we should be, uh, we should uh, care, uh, um, we should be careful about the, this number of the uh, dose in the carbon ion therapy. Uh, difficult to, to answer for me. <laughs> okay. No, no, I appreciate it. I think that's exactly you know, what we, we were trying to figure out. Uh, so it sounds like you use the standard uh, multiplier as far as at least three um, for all disease sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, I was going to move here to the next question. So this is going to be uh, more so for um, Dr. Mao. But the question is, you know, what, what is the holdup, essentially, as far as this from becoming more popular in the United States? Um, they mentioned some of the, the advantages of carbon, um, but clearly it's been delayed. I think that's going to have a lot to do with, with finances, um, but you can expand on that a bit if you'd like. Yeah, but most definitely. And that's probably the main reason why, why it hasn't really been adopted. Um, how long of a wait, you know, but I just know about the Mayo Clinic Center, that's looking to be another five plus years before it's actually treating patients. And a lot of that has to do with, um, this is still experimental in, in the US. So a lot of that has to do with the FDA approval. A lot of that has to do with a lot of the preclinical work that we need to do to get carbon ion really off the ground. Um, I, I hope once one center comes up, there'll be others that pop up. And there have been some other institutions that have expressed interest over, over the years of bringing carbon to the U.S. Um, but the big downside of this is just the cost. This is very expensive um, to do the preclinical work, to do the clinical work, to basically do every step of the process to get between here and actually treating patients here in the States. Um, it's on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that, that's a large investment. Um, 
and that's you know what for an institution to write that kind of a check at one time is pretty substantial and that's been the, the primary limitation so far i well, appreciate it and uh, the next um, question listed here is is asking uh, directly the same thing as far as cost and and they specifically were interested in knowing you know what the cost of starting a, a new single room unit is and i know that's going to be very variable in the united states since one hasn't been started yet but Dr. Suji, would you be able to answer for us um, kind of cost estimates of how much it has been it takes to implement this in Japan? Uh, do you mean the current current cost? And uh, or so, the... yeah, right. So the cost of if you wanted to start a new single room unit to open a new unit. Single room unit. Uh, um, the quantum scalpel uh, I introduced in the, my presentation, <laughs> which will be uh, it, uh, when it uh, realize, uh, it will, uh, uh, its cost will be, uh, uh, I think uh, the first machine will, will be a 50 million dollar or something like that, like that. but, Current cost is uh, much higher than that, uh, uh, 150 or something like that. Um, uh, not, not for one room. Uh, uh, in Yamagata, they have two rooms and probably 150 million dollars or something like that. But the uh, quantum scalper will be uh, much lower, so uh, 50 or something like that. And it will, be, it can be. A become cheaper and cheaper uh, if the it's a spread widely. Understood and appreciate it. The next question um, will be specific, and this will be for for you, Doctor Suji. Um, they're asking about the adenoid cystic carcinoma or paranasal maxillary sinus case that you had shown before. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to know: Did you cover cranial nerves? as far as from base of skull, if there was perineural invasion in that case? And, and if so, you know, what do you think the comparison is of that with carbon versus another modality? Do you mean the uh, difference in the uh, side effect or? Uh, yeah, either way, yeah. Well, first of all, just if, if you did cover them if, or you would cover them if there was perineural invasion, and then yes, you know, as far as what you think difference uh, would be with side effect or outcome. Uh, for the for the adenocystic carcinoma in the uh, head and neck region, we applied uh, uh, 64 gray RBE in uh, 16 fractions. Now, so when uh, the cranial, cranial nerve uh, was uh, is uh, included in the high dose area it will be uh, uh, damaged with a high uh, probability. But um, as you know, uh, carbon ion beam has a uh, very good dose concentration, not, not only by the uh, black peak, or, but also uh, with a very sharp lateral fall off. So we can spare effectively uh, the input, uh, critical uh, part of the uh, nerves. So uh, it can be, can be applied uh, more widely than x-rays, I think. Okay, thank you. The next question has to do uh, both with the rotating gantry and image guidance. And so they, they're interested to know, you know, is image guidance, the way that we do it here as far as the United States and as far as with conventional radiation, we use a lot of it. Um, so KV, MVX rays, cone beam CTs, even MRI guided. And so they're asking, you know, how is image guidance or adaptive therapy used um, with, with carbon? And additionally, are there any differences between your rotating gantry systems and, and the fixed beams? Um, okay, uh, for the image guidance, it's a little bit uh, um, uh, not uh, sufficiently uh, um actually not not so uh sufficiently uh, 
performing at our, at our institute. We just studied the uh, uh, fiducial marker or something like that to use uh, uh, a kind of uh, image guidance. And, but uh, we don't have this in-room CT yet. And um, <clears throat> so in, in future uh, facility, it should, it should, should have the in-room CT. But concerning the MRI, uh, it, uh, it, I think it's a little difficult to, to, um, to get the good um, images by the uh, uh, particle beam and uh, uh, MRI gym images. I, I, I'm not sure about the, it, some, some, some difficulties uh, there. Uh, we, we have another idea to develop a uh, 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 PET scan in the treatment room, but uh, it's still a uh, uh, basic research uh, level right now. I don't know, appreciate it. Definitely did not know about the, the PET scan, um, but I think this is a, it's been an important question in general, as far as not even just carbon, but also protons as, as we've tried to catch up with protons to x-rays with image guidance. And so all that information is very helpful. Uh, the next question, and it will be for, for, for everyone, is have, have, have either of you seen an increase uh, over the last decade as far as the number of United States patients going back and forth um, for, to Japan for, for carbon treatment. I guess we could expand this to any other international patients as well. And, and what, how has that process been for the patients? Process means, um, uh, we, of course we can, uh, we can accept the foreign patient from a, anywhere in the world, but um, it's, you know, at present, you know, uh, it's difficult, difficult by the uh, uh, COVID-19. The patient should wait some uh, uh, one or two weeks at a uh, hotel or something, uh, hotel or uh, so difficult to come come to Japan to receive the carbon therapy at, at the facility. But uh, we we have some. Um, we have a special uh, uh, department to receiving the uh, to receive the uh, foreign patients, so uh, we can we can uh, accept. Is that right? Yeah, no, appreciate it. So it sounds like uh, essentially they've of course decreased uh, temporarily as oh, far yeah. as foreign yeah. patients because of because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but I, well, we'll we'll see. I think in the future if that that changes at all um, as that calms down. Yeah, and, and what, one area of research interest, at least here in the States, is to randomize patients. Patients get photon slash proton will stay here. Photons getting carbon can go abroad. And so that's that's one kind of solution to getting some, some randomized carbon data uh, before we actually have a center treating here in the States. Thanks, that's a very good point. Uh, looking down the line of questions here, um, so next one is, is a little specific, and I know you're not uh, basic, basic science research. So I'm going to start with the, the end of the paragraph and move backwards. Um, so for Dr. Suji, in your experience, have, have there been any, any clinical data where you've looked at secondary cancers? And is there less secondary cancers with carbon compared to um, traditional that you've expected? A secondary cancer... Uh, uh, um... Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, so right. So, a cancer that's caused by the radiation itself. Ah, okay. Uh, you mean that? Uh, do do we have the experience of treating secondary cancer? Right. Correct. Or no, not treating secondary cancers. Um, cancers that are are later caused um, by the radiation treatment. So you know, five, ten years later, in comparison to photon therapy. Oh, we have treated not so many, but few cases of secondary cancer due to that X-ray therapy. Is it correct, correct answer? So uh, we have a few experience on, on this. Okay, 
Yeah, no, the, the, the question I think isn't specifically about treating the secondary cancers. Um, it's about, in your, in your experience, have there been less secondary cancers developed when you treat with carbon versus x-rays? <laughs> so, so, so a cancer from the radiation. Mm, um. it, uh, can I actually interject while we're, sure, we're kind of sure? There's a one study that has actually looked at this. the The rate of second cancers formed after treatment with carbon ions compared to others, mm -hmm. and this was a population study. Um, and I, I put it in the question and answer, a link to that. And I think Dr. Ebner did as well, but it's, it's a population study, very similar to our NCDB study. So it comes with, or SEER. So it comes with those kind of inherent uh, retrospective biases, but there was an advantage uh, with carbon uh, compared to photon irradiation for rectal and bladder cancer. So again, this is still kind of in its infancy when looking at the secondary um, cancer induction rate, but it's still something that as we get more data, as we get more patients treated, hopefully we can have a more definitive answer. But again, it's still a question in, in protons. Oh, the question is on the uh, incidence of, of the secondary cancer after carbon therapy, right? Right. Ah, as, as uh, I showed you about uh, pro prostate cancer, uh, and it's just a 10 years period, 10 years period, but uh, uh, obviously lower than next year after the X-ray therapy, but uh, uh, other uh, tumor sites, uh, there are no not enough data to evaluate uh, uh, secondary cancer uh, incidence of the uh, secondary cancer because uh, uh, they are a much worse uh, prognosis than X-ray. So uh, not so many patients uh, living longer than ten years or something like that. So difficult to uh, evaluate. Uh, some some um, doctors try to uh, to assess, but not yet uh, enough data uh, on on that. But, but we, we have uh, now, as I, as I said, uh, we have um, uh, seven institute in Japan. So maybe uh, five ten years later, we can uh, show some. Uh, data on that right i uh, know appreciate it yeah no i think that that answers the question great from both of you thank you so much um i think as far as uh, additional questions and some details that are related to these questions we can answer the rest of them um offline uh, we're, we're a bit over time as we are but thank you to everyone that's that's joined you know so much i, I would like to just go ahead and conclude uh the webinar the, the slide that's up here, you know, shows the links uh, as far as for, for membership, and we encourage you to join the ACR so you can be updated um, with future webinars that we might have. Again, this is part of a series, and so you'll have access to all of those through that link. Um, you know, please fill out our post-webinar survey, and from there, I really just would like to thank everyone for joining us, uh, and thanks to um, Teresa Powell and Ari Amini for all of your contributions to this webinar series in general. And of course, very, very special thanks to each of our speakers. I know this is a topic with limited expertise and, and you both did, a, I think, a remarkable job um, going through both your presentations and, and fielding those questions. Uh, so have a wonderful rest of your evening, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all again at our next ACR Radiation Oncology webinar. Thank you. <laughs>